October 17th, 1989, Candlestick Park, San Francisco. The Bay Bridge is falling down, man. It's in the drink, man. Uh-oh, my first thought. Going to take quite a while to get home tonight. <laughs> but here we are at Candlestick Park, the home of the Giants. We're here for game three of a very unique World Series between the, our two local baseball teams, the Oakland Athletics and the San Francisco Giants. The game is due to start in a few minutes. But moments ago, place shook like crazy, and then everybody cheered, and now we're left with questions. Was that the big one? Mm -hmm. Did the Bay Bridge really fall down? Where the hell is Daryl? And finally, the big question that has been bothering me for weeks was, which team am I going to root for? <laughs> Let me back up a step. I was born in Brooklyn, and I lived there until I was six. So by birthright, my legacy team was the Dodgers. <laughs> Until that day in the mid-50s when they announced, those Brooklyn bums announced they were moving to California along with the New York Giants, a team I knew nothing about, except I knew they had a player named Willie Mays who was supposed to be pretty good. Now, I was the only baseball fan in my family, uh, and the only team left in New York was the, the Yankees, who I'd hated my entire young life. But now they became my hometown heroes. I love rooting for Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris, great sluggers, and guys with nicknames like Whitey Ford and Yogi Berra and Moose Scourin. Who could resist those nicknames? Mm -hmm. And they won a lot. But as I said, I was the only baseball fan in my family, the only sports fan, really. And I never went to a game the entire time I was growing up. <laughs> My dad made it really clear. He had absolutely no interest in attending a baseball game in person. Listen, he said, you know, the traffic is so bad going to events like that. You'll never, ever, ever get there on time. If you manage to get there at all. <laughs> I believed him. What did I know? I was 10. But I was the only fan, so I watched games on, my, on TV by myself. I listened to the radio and I discovered the power of baseball on the radio. I could visualize the games. I could see exactly what was happening in my mind's eye. Now, I remained a Yankee fan through high school. And once I got to college, I had other interests. I stopped following professional sports. I was more interested in girls and drugs and studying, well, or at least the first two. And I continued to ignore professional sports for years. All the time I was in college, I moved out here to the Bay Area to go to grad school. And while I was here, I completely ignored, completely missed out on the Oakland A's three world championships in the early 1970s. So I went along blissfully. I had a nice life. I was happy, but I had no sports in my life until one day in the early 80s. I worked as a cinematographer and I accepted an assignment for Channel 2 in Oakland. We want you to go into the A's locker room at Oakland Coliseum and interview Billy Martin. Now, Billy Martin was the manager of the A's and he had a real cantankerous reputation. But he was very gracious to us because I was accompanied by a producer who he really enjoyed trying to flirt with. And, and after the interview, my producer Nancy and I slipped into the grandstands and we sat in, in, the, in the Coliseum for an afternoon game, very close to first base. I could practically reach out and touch the players. We got a couple of shots of the, of the game and mostly we just basked in the sunshine. And I suddenly realized that this game that I had loved from afar for so long was really accessible. You actually could go to the game. There were thousands of people there. Wait till I tell Pop. Who knew? But this began, be, be, began the beginning. This was the beginning of an epiphany about baseball that became an obsession. I took my dear wife, Susan, to a game the next night and we both had a great time and I started following the A's on a day-to-day -day basis. For Mother's Day, we took our infant son to Candlestick Park for the Mother's Day celebration. The following year, my parents came out to visit and we dragged them to Oakland Coliseum and they had a great time. Even my father, he, he was happy to find out you could go to the game, especially if he didn't have to drive. He enjoyed it quite a bit. My mom said, my mom was counting balls and strikes. She was involved in every pitch of the game. And she said, you know, I used to really enjoy going to Dodger games at Evans Field in Brooklyn when I was a young woman. Then I met your father. <laughs> but here's my dirty little secret. For years, 
I was a bi-coastal baseball fan. I remember for the A's and the Giants who, who played on opposite coast of San Francisco Bay. <laughs> Not everybody appreciates this. Many people would tell me, many people consider it heresy. They called me a bad fan. People said, you can't root for two teams. You're not a real fan. My son, my son took a lot of flack for it in school from people who, who accused him of heresy. But what was so heinous about loving two teams? If I adored the Dodgers and if I if I adored the Giants and the A's, was I if I adored the Giants, was I cheating on the A's? Was I two timing? Was this like two timing a lover if you like two teams? I never really understood what all the fuss was about. But I persevered, and for years I was a bi-coastal fan. We lived in San Francisco, fairly close to Candlestick Park, and I'd slip out and go to games there. And, and then we moved to the East Bay, and we started going to a lot of games in Oakland. Big deal. This continued for a number of years uh, until uh, the Battle of the Bay. The A's and Giants met there. Uh, both won their respective uh, leagues. They were facing each other in the World Series. This was the first time it had ever happened. My kids, we had indoctrinated them in this bi-coastal business. And they, they were very impressed by the fact that both our teams were in the World Series. And wasn't that the way it always was? Well, it wasn't the way it always was. I loved rooting for two teams because when one was mediocre, the other would excel. <laughs> or sometimes they were both really mediocre. But <laughs> still enjoyed watching every pitch and, and analyzing what was going on. Now, the Battle of the Bay really confounded me because I just didn't know who to root for. I love the A's. I loved Jose Canseco and, and Mark McGuire, great sluggers. Ricky Henderson, the greatest base stealer of all time. But I also liked the Giants and Will Clark and Kevin Mitchell and, and Matt Williams. They were great people, so I thought. Great players. Uh, and it was, I was kind of a toss-up as to what to do. The one thing I was sure of, though, was I wanted to go to the game. I wanted to go see, see this happening. Now, it isn't always comfortable for us bi-coastal people. And by the way, there are more bicoastal fans in the Bay Area than in any of the other two team markets. In Chicago, the Cubs and White Sox don't share any fans. In New York, the Yankees and the upstart expansion team, the Mets, they don't share fans at all. And in LA, the Dodgers and the Angels uh, have completely separate fan bases. But I wanted to go to the game. So I, I uh, bought two tickets from a scalper, two very expensive tickets, and I invited my, my buddy Daryl to go with me. We got to the game. I knew Daryl was rooting for the Giants, and I was still undecided. The A's had won the first two games of the series, and this was game three. Daryl went off in search of beers. And I was sitting back in, in the grandstands feeling like, this is great. I'm at the World Series. This is the pinnacle of my baseball fandom. And then the place started to shake and shimmy and rock and roll. And a huge earthquake hit Candlestick Park, or at least that's what it felt like. It was an earthquake, but we didn't know the extent of it at the time. I looked, I looked down on the field, and there was a huge mound of earth moving along underneath the sod, like a giant rolling pin gone mad underground. I looked at the grandstand to the right, and it was rippling like sheets in the wind. I looked up at the wind baffle, and I knew all these parts of the stadium were reinforced concrete. I looked up at the wind baffle that had been added to the stadium years before in order to tame the cantankerous candlestick winds. And the wind baffle was flopping around like cardboard. How did this happen? What enormous natural forces could do this? It was pretty amazing. After 15 minutes, it felt like 15 minutes of this. They told us later the quake lasted 15 seconds. <laughs> After it was over, there was an astonished silence in the ballpark. And then everybody cheered. Yay! And I thought, why are we cheering? And then I realized, what better greeting for the World Series than something very typical of Northern California. We have fog, we have hills, we have shoreline, and we have earthquakes. Couldn't bring the fog. The hills were going to stay where they were. Here's an earthquake. Welcome, world. Happy to see you. So Daryl eventually came back, and he'd been on. He said, "He said, you know, he says I was online for beers. He said I was the eighth guy online for beers." And then the place shook, and then everybody cheered. Why'd they cheer? I said, "I don't know. We cheered out here too." He said, and "When I looked again, nobody left the beer line." 
And somebody cut ahead of me, and now I was ninth on line. We weren't really sure what to do. We looked down on the field, and the players and their wives and children were starting to gather on the field, and we realized as the sun was going down, we realized that the lights were off in the stadium and the scoreboard was off. Mm -hmm. And the guy in front of me had told, who said, the Bay Bridge fell in the drink, man. Oh. He had a little radio and he was reporting the news to us. And he said, he said, the power is out all over town. I wonder if they're gonna hold the game. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty dark here. And I looked down in the field and a couple of cop cars had pulled out on the field. And they were using their bullhorns and going, go home. <laughs> No game tonight. Go home. No game tonight. And when I realized that nothing was going to happen, and it was getting dark, and we didn't have flashlights or anything, we hightailed it out of there. Now, I wasn't parked that far away, but to get from, my, from, from our seats to my car, and then to Darrell's neighborhood, uh, and the Potrero District, Potrero Hill District of San Francisco, which was just a few miles away, it took us three hours. <laughs> The power was out everywhere. The traffic lights were out. Traffic was snarled everywhere. I decided to stay at Daryl's house for the evening because maybe let things simmer down a little. But around midnight, I got, I got restless. I said, I'm going home. I knew I couldn't hop across the Bay Bridge because it was in the drink, right? And so I decided to head north through the city to the Golden Gate. And then across through Marin County and across the Richmond Bridge and back to the East Bay. I set out in Daryl's neighborhood and it was like the old movie Escape from New York. It was really creepy and dark and weird. The city felt dead, not the lively, bright, brilliant place that it usually is. I crossed Market Street and took Van Ness Avenue north. And a lot of, a lot of corners were uncontrolled because there were no traffic lights, there were no street lights. Cars were honking and trying to get past each other. It was chaos. But in a number of corners, there were ordinary citizens out there doing their, doing their, their best imitations of traffic cops. <laughs> and this brought a smile to everybody's face. And people were laughing and honking their horns and, and greeting and smiling and waving at each other. This spontaneous citizen's self-mobilization was really wonderful after the disaster that we'd just been through. Eventually I got home, greeted my family, everyone was safe, thank goodness, and, and uh, decided to go to sleep finally and see what was gonna happen the next day. Um, more than 60 people died in the earthquake of 89, which was eventually rated at 7.1 on the Richter scale, the highest earthquake in this area in many, many years. But um, apparently the starting time for the World Series helped to prevent many deaths. In Oakland, the, uh, a mile and a half of a double-decker freeway called the Cypress Structure had collapsed. A mile and a half of freeway collapsed on itself. And the first estimate from the state officials was that they were, they were dreading the fact that they were pretty sure they would find hundreds and hundreds of bodies based on normal traffic patterns in this mile and a half of collapse, collapsed freeway. But in the next few weeks, as they carefully excavated and pulled up every piece of concrete and every piece of steel, they only found 42 victims. Of course, everyone was tragic and sad, but the death toll was much, much lower than everyone had expected. Even on the Bay Bridge, which hadn't fallen in the drink, what had happened was it had shaken itself so violently that a 50-foot section of roadbed had slipped and fallen from the upper deck onto the lower deck. Even on the Bay Bridge, with this cataclysmic uh, uh, result, only one person died. And the same thing was true all over in Northern California. And the reason given was the earthquake happened a few, few minutes before the anticipated start of, the, of the, the World Series game. And almost everybody was already home waiting for the start of the game. Mm. Now, the, the quake didn't have this was not the big one. There wasn't widespread destruction. The whole city didn't fall down, although my parents and everyone else I knew anywhere else in the country was watching the news, and it looked like San Francisco was aflame and the half of the city had fallen down, none of which was true. But that's news. Um, but the quake took a big emotional toll. I, I, I know my mood soured in the economic slowdown that followed it. People 
the, the, the bridge was down, which really disrupted uh, transportation all over the Bay Area, and there were dozens and dozens of aftershocks in the weeks following the earthquake, which kept everybody on edge, and all of a sudden, go, is that somebody walking across the floor, or is that an aftershock? It was very, very scary. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't feel good about things. I took, I, I took our dog Sophie to the park down by the bay that she loved. And every time I went, I would obsess about, am I going to be able to get back? There's only one road in and out. In and out. What, if, what if the aftershocks break that road? I won't be able to get, get back home. I obsessed about whether our house was bolted to its foundation, whether our deck that was already kind of shaky was going to fall down just all by itself. Um, I, 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 I followed the earthquake news uh, and, and nerve-wracked over every aftershock. I, was, I realized for, after a while that I was depressed and I didn't want to talk to anybody. I decided it would be good for me to go see some of the wreckage in, all, in Oakland. I have no idea why I thought that. I took Sophie in the car and we drove, and it was kind of a bust as a trip. I couldn't park anywhere nearby. And I ended up parking very far away and we, had, we got about a five minute walk in. And on the way back home, Sophie threw up in my car. <laughs> All of which was pretty depressing. <laughs> and it turned out I wasn't the only one. There were millions of people like me who hadn't been around big damage, but had been scared by the earthquake and just wanted to, just ha had no outlet for it. TV shrinks and TV news reports constantly were saying, everyone's feeling this way. Go talk to somebody, talk to your coworkers, talk to your family, talk to your friends. Just get it out. You don't have to bear this by yourself. Everybody's feeling this way. And I thought, what do I have to lose? I saw my neighbor out on the street, and I ran over to her, and I, and I just started, I launched into this, this uh, discussion of, <laughs> by the way, I launched into a discussion of what had happened at Candlestick Park. <laughs> the, uh, the, the rolling pin under the turf, the grandstand rippling, the, my midnight drive across San Francisco. And she looked at me, and I thought, she thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> and then she blurted out what had happened to her. She, she was at home, she went running out of the house, out on the sidewalk to see the whole, whole street shaking, and she, she described how the utility poles were whipping back and forth. An image, an evil image, like something out of a cartoon that I've had in my mind ever since, even though I didn't witness it myself. I went down to the Burger Depot in our neighborhood and talked to my friend Dave, the owner, as I wolfed down one of his cheeseburgers, and asked him what the quake was like for him. And he said he, that he had been in the shop when it happened, a place where he'd spent 12 hours a day for the last 30 years, and all of a sudden it felt unsafe. He said the place was shaking, dishes and glasses were rattling off the, off the walls and smashing on the ground, and it was terrifying. Now, it took, it took some time for things to get back to normal. I know it took weeks for my psyche to get soothed. Uh, they resumed the, the World Series after 10 days. I rooted for the A's. And, they, and the, A's, the A's won in four games. <laughs> the Bay Bridge took a month to fix. And when they announced that it was ready to be open, they said that the day before they were opening the Bay Bridge to traffic, they were going to have a bridge walk. Mm -hmm. They'd never had a, they'd never let ordinary people walk on the Bay Bridge before in the 50 years since it had opened. And I was really excited. I really wanted to go there. I really wanted to be on the bridge walk. I wanted to bear witness. I felt like I had a special stake in the bridge and the destruction because I'd been at the earthquake game. I was at the World Series. Nobody really cared, but, but I did. And so I decided to take my son, Rozzy, out of first grade and drag him along to, to the bridge. I explained the history to him, and we got on buses that the state provided. We met at Golden Gate Fields at the racetrack, and, and they had buses from there. They dropped us at the base of the bridge, just past the metering lights and the toll plaza. And we started a long trek uphill. The ribbon cutting ceremony they had planned a ribbon cutting ceremony for the, for the bridge walk. And it was out in the middle of the bridge at the point where the break had been. And they were going to have the mayor of Oakland and the mayor of San Francisco and the governor. And they were, and they were going to have bands playing and Tony Bennett singing and 
you know, it was supposed to be a joyous, joyous event. And it was, it was a beautiful day, it was sunny and bright, and we, you know, we started, we had a really nice walk. That section of the bridge was completely repainted, it looked fresh and clean. Hundreds of Caltran workers, Caltrans workers were out there wearing hard hats and greeting everybody with big smiles and shaking hands and saying, thank you for coming, welcome back. Thank you for coming, welcome back. The media was swarming everywhere. A radio reporter took my son Razi aside, my, my six-year-old, and interviewed him and said, why are you here? And Razi said, well, my daddy, my daddy told me that it's important that we, that we go look at the place where the bridge was broken because they fixed it and it's now stronger than it was before the earthquake, which was true. They put extra bracing in the part that they fixed. And he said, he said, it's important that we show the world that we think the bridge is safe now. And that's why we're all here. I was so proud of him. Even at six, he was eminently quotable. <laughs> so we continued to walk uphill and walk uphill and walk uphill, trying to get to the place we were, where the ceremony was going to happen. And I could see the bunting up ahead, and we could hear the bands playing. But eventually, reality set in. Um, the, uh, it, it turned cold and windy. And it, was, it got a little scary, too, because it's one thing to ride across the bridge on your, on your, in your car, but it's another thing to walk up to the bridge. And I was really impressed by how enormous it was, and it was hard to miss the fact that just four weeks before, this place had shaken so violently that it had broken part of itself. We decided to head back, and that was fine with me. I'd had my bridge walk. I'd had my moment of history. Best of all, what I learned was that regardless of how you felt about baseball or what team you rooted for, <laughs> we were all on the same team. <laughs> we were all in this together. The healing was well underway. Thank you.